engineering project eight decades in the making. The first new underground railway to be built in London for over half a century. A scheme more delayed than, well, there's not many things more delayed than this. Cross, I mean the Elizabeth line, is finally, mercifully finished. So now let's tell the story of this up until now ill-fated bit of transport infrastructure. Whilst wandering through it, how did we get here? Did we even want this? And what does the future hold? So, where to begin? Well, the Elizabeth Line Central Core, you know, the new flashy bit of the railway, that starts here at Paddington Station. And our story starts in 1941, you know, 80 years ago. And, you know, in 1941, the United Kingdom had some other things going on. But one of them, somehow, was Crossrail. Now, a man named George Dow, who, by the way, inspired Harry Beck's now iconic map of the London Underground system when he made his own map of the London and North Eastern Railway first in that kind of diagrammatic style. He wrote in the Star newspaper that he thought it'd be a swell idea if we constructed new, big diameter railway tunnels, not your poxy London Underground lines, all the way between Paddington to Liverpool Street. Paddington to Liverpool Street. Hmm. In the same article, he proposed a north-south railway in a similar vein, which now exists as the central core of Thameslink. So he was a pretty cool guy, as far as railway people go. Whilst his ideas were on point and now have reached fruition, at the time, they went absolutely nowhere. We'll pick that story up in a moment, but whilst we're here, let's look around Paddington for a minute. The line comes out of the west and dives underground just before here and the platforms have been built kind of alongside the mainline terminus. The most obvious thing they've built is this giant 120 metre glass canopy adorned with different cloud formations that apparently could never exist together in real life. So a little meteorological fantasy for your daily commute there. The appearance of them also apparently changes with different lighting conditions. It's so large you can even see it from space with specialists telescopic camera equipment, you know, like a like a spy satellite or something. You, you, you can't see with the naked eye. That, that would be impossible. I actually don't like it very much, but it lets natural light hit the platforms below, which is an impressive feat, and I appreciate the bold vision. I mean, this used to be a taxi rank. Inside, the station is visually quite impressive. And one bit I like from a practical perspective is the link to the Bakerloo platforms. The initial plans for this link ended up abandoned because the whole station on top was apparently at risk of collapsing due to it, which I believe is an important thing to at least consider. They spent a lot of money making a much deeper but very convenient and I assume safe interchange. The walls of it have a pattern copied from Brunel's station roof design and the tunnels are long enough that they get these cute little rest areas for anyone that needs them. Moving on to Bond Street, and in our story we've now got the idea, but we need the political will. And obviously the worst thing you can put in the way of a good idea is the British government. Over several decades, lots of lovely rail proposals got made, one of which became the Jubilee Line, the Victoria Line, even Thameslink got set up, but still, this Paddington to Liverpool Street Railway never quite got made. In 1974, the London Rail Study Report came up with the name Crossrail to describe a railway that was going to be built between Paddington and Liverpool Street again. They also had the idea that maybe it should serve London Heathrow Airport. Now, where have I seen that before? <sighs> but it never got built. Speaking of not getting around to things, you'll have noticed that I'm not standing inside the complete Bond Street station, but instead I'm standing outside the rather incomplete Bond Street station. Despite the entire Crossroad project being several years delayed, that was not quite enough extra time to finish Bond Street. Now the cause of the delays here at Bond Street, I would argue, are a little bit unexplained. The very impressive Crossrail CEO Mark Wilde says that because they had to remove some of the tunnel boring machines from Bond Street, they couldn't start building the station here until much later than the rest of the line. I'd argue that the Mayfair location, some of the tunnelling conditions are probably a bit trickier than elsewhere and that might not have helped, but you still get the sense reading in between the lines that the contractors here still failed in a pretty spectacular way. When it eventually opens, they say it will almost have the longest escalator on the underground network after Angel, which would make that almost an interesting fact. It opens in three months' time, they say. 
So then there's another plan in the 80s which doesn't get built and in the 90s a private members bill was put before parliament that tried to get it built as a London Underground line which would at least have saved us from the endless, endless debates about whether Crossrail is the tube or not. Okay, so you want to know what I think? Well, hold on to your wigs I'm going to tell you. No. Absolutely not. It is very clearly not a London Underground line. It starts counties away from the capital and runs through the centre in tunnels which are much too wide, on trains that are much too long and are painted completely the wrong colour. It's operationally distinct, it's financially distinct, it even looks like this on the tube map. The Circle Line doth not do these things. Even TfL have come out to say it's not an underground line. It's more like Thames Link than anything else, although that's messier and it's not run at all by TfL. But the whole problem comes from the fact that Boris Johnson decided to call it the Elizabeth Line instead of Crossrail 1 or something because the Elizabeth Line sounds like a tube line. So now imagine me, the average Starbucks drinking commuter getting onto my train at Tottenham Court Road and I look around and I see an underground railway that runs between underground stations, it's on the tube map, it's enveloped inside the Oyster Zone, it's high frequency, it's high capacity and its name is even a sequel to the Victoria Line. You're never going to convince my caramel macchiato loving self that I'm not on the tube. So no, it's not the London Underground, but it's gonna feel like it, so we may as well just move on with our lives. Let's give up and let's get annoyed at the important things, like how on the new line diagrams that list all the connections, it says Central, Victoria, Jubilee, then Elizabeth Line. It's the only one that says Line. And that makes sense, because it's its own modality and it's not part of the tube, as I've just said, but it's also, when you think about it, completely stupid. Either way, uh, I've actually made it to an open station this time. It's Tottenham Court Road, where a few years ago I spent a while here in St Giles Circus pondering over all the redevelopments that were taking place, so please refer to that vintage episode. Uh, and St Giles Circus is where one end of the Elizabeth Line station is. And the other end is here at Dean Street, where construction work started 12 years ago, and uh, they haven't quite finished the oversight developments yet. Those are going to become apartments, and they look very pricey. Uh, ironically, I'm pretty sure Karl Marx used to live on Dean Street um, and Nelson, like uh, Admiral Nelson, stayed here the night before going into one of his battles, uh, famously visiting one of the local Soho undertakers to get fitted up for a coffin in case he did not survive. And the battle where he was going to was Trafalgar and I hear he did not survive. Slightly unrelated, but there's also a long history of venereal diseases being treated at different institutions here on Dean Street, which has culminated in probably the most famous sexual health clinic in the country now being situated here. If you know, you know. Uh, and now better linked than ever before. This is one of my favourite new builds for the railway. The bit over at Tottenham Court Road is a massive improvement over what was there a decade ago. And over here at Dean Street, even though it's not the biggest new station, they've tried to theme it to the cultural nightlife of Soho. So it's filled with dark glass and metal, and I, I just think it's great. The lighting fixtures, which apparently absorb sound somehow, are designed to look like theatrical lights. There are circular patterns on the walls everywhere, which are supposed to be like an abstracted map of Soho. If you look closely, you can spot some underground roundels in there. Also look out for the hand-painted golden pattern above the St Giles escalators, which leads you down to a red wall, which memorialises the red curtain of the old Astoria Theatre and later music venue, which was torn down from this spot to build the station. There's actually plans for a new theatre to be built right on top of the tunnels. It sounds like a pretty stupid place to put a theatre, but the Barbican Centre sits on top of the Metropolitan Line and they seem to be doing okay. Speaking of, the next stop is Farringdon, a station so long that unofficially it actually connects to Barbican. Seriously, so these trains are longer than that never-ending corridor in Green Park. If you accidentally walk in the wrong direction and get off at the wrong end of the train, you could end up an entire stop away from where you want it to be. In the overarching story, it's now 2005. I am now alive and in school, and a Labour government puts a bill through Parliament that three years later is finally signed into law by Queen Elizabeth II as the Crossrail Act. It's finally happening this time, and it's all scheduled to be delivered by 2017. A somewhat pixelated graphic from the BBC News website at the time shows the routes that then Transport Secretary Alistair Darling was considering, which including the final route chosen between Reading and Shenfield with a cute little appendix for Heathrow, had routes to other places such as Ebbsfleet in Kent or Norbiton near Kingston-upon-Thames. 
As someone who used to live very near Norbiton, I can assure you that being included on this BBC News website graphic is the most exciting thing that has ever happened to Norbiton. The funding agreed at the start of all this was just short of £16 billion. Pounds. And as I speak to you today, it's now just short of £19 billion, pounds, which sounds really expensive. But when you think about it, it remains extremely, extremely expensive. Where's all that cash coming from? Well, if I demonstrate it with these Smarties, let's imagine that this is 19 billion pounds. Five billion of it comes from the UK taxpayer. That's Smarties from your own pocket. Three billion pounds comes from a taxpayer loan. So those are Smarties which we'll hopefully get back one day. And four billion comes from businesses in the local area paying higher taxes and business rates and such like. Two billion pounds comes from transport for London, and that makes sense. They're going to get all the use out of it. That's where your oyster fares have been going. Two or three additional smarties come from businesses directly funding their railway. That's people like Heathrow Airport. They've got something big to get out of it, and they're willing to pay for it. And the rest come from the City of London and the Greater London Authority. It's London. It's a mostly London-based railway. That's your money again. So it, it's a lot of smarties here and most of them seem to be coming out of your pocket. So, built on mountains of candy-coated chocolate, we're here at Farringdon, where along with the Elizabeth Line, London Underground and Thameslink, there'll be a train departing every 22 seconds in the peak. This station is another one of my favourites. The Farringdon entrance is themed around the diamonds and jewellery merchants that have long inhabited the local Hatton Garden area, at times subtly and at times not so subtle. They lead you down to platforms that are 260 metres long, even though the trains are only 205 metres long. This is to scale, by the way, in case in the future they want to add extra carriages in. What's interesting about this station is that instead of stopping in the middle of the platform, like at most stations, because 80% of the passengers are going to be heading for Farringdon, the trains will be stopping disproportionately towards that end. But the fun side is the Barbican Inn because the remnants of the tunnel boring machines that dug out the running tunnels leading up to here are buried just behind there, along with a time capsule and, yeah, probably a few plague victims. And in order to fit lift access into the Barbican side of the station, just like at Liverpool Street, they put in some incline lifts. Ooh. Worth the price of your fare alone, I'd say. The Barbican end is themed to the Smithfield markets, which are nearby. And in fact, the Farringdon platforms are kind of built directly underneath them. There's a lift to actual Barbican station, although they're keeping that very quiet. It's not officially linked there, although you can get there. So it's, uh, it's really just a secret for the two of us. One stop further at Liverpool Street, and one end this time is very officially not Liverpool Street, but is in fact Moorgate Station, which raises all sorts of route-based nerdy questions I'm sure the transport vloggers are digging into as we speak. But it also creates this monstrosity on the tube map, which apparently we're calling the Moorgate Liverpool Street Complex, featuring two Elizabeth line stops, which are in fact the same station, two Circle line stops, which are in fact different stations, and the Overground, which is now five inches away on the map from the station name itself. Okay, so now we're building a railway. The crossrail running tunnels were constructed by four pairs of tunnel boring machines that were named after pairs of women. They'd finished their job in 2015 and the track laying had finished by 2017. So since then it's just been about installing equipment, fitting out stations and getting the whole thing to actually work. It's hard to put into words the scale of what they did here. I mean, 75,000 people worked on building this thing. And the things they got up to were insane. I've had to literally write them down. They were too much for me. Uh, it involved draining Victorian docks, taking over and reconstructing an abandoned Victorian railway, building two new tunnels under the Thames. They built a 115 hectare nature reserve in Essex from where there was nothing before out of all the soil they dug up from the whole project. The railway traverses three completely separate signalling systems. The trains drive themselves in the central core and they even reverse themselves with no one in the cab at all at Paddington, although that bit doesn't actually work yet. Uh, they refurbished 32 existing stations, built nine new central London stations and they're not even finished yet. They've got to build a whole new one now at Old Oak Common. I mean, how did we even expect them to finish this thing on time? Included in this, and they published an interesting series of books actually on the subject, was the largest coordinated archaeological investigation this city has perhaps ever seen, ranging from plague pits to prehistoric treasure troves and woolly mammoth skeletons. Here at Liverpool Street, they constructed that ticket hall through the burial site of 4,000 people who died at Bedlam, which is basically our first and pretty terrible psychiatric hospital. 
It's now in Beckenham, interestingly, via what's now the Imperial War Museum. It's, it's a very long story. Quite daringly, they seem to have incorporated that into the design scheme of the ticket hall itself, which is really interesting. They've also gone for pinstripes as a theme, which is supposedly to honour all of the financial and city workers who, who come through the station every day, as if their large bonus checks weren't quite enough. 